glad that you're all with us this morning to uh, uh, hear the word of God for worship. It's important that we're in a place of worship. Uh, we can worship at any time and at any place, but to dedicate and time and set aside and come to a place, I believe that there's just something about that that, that shows what's happening with our heart, what's happening with our, our faith. This morning I'm going to be talking about the place, and it may sound kind of unusual, but as I go through this, you'll understand what's being said as we go through here. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number 26, the Bible tells us, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today, and go after other gods that you have not known. So here, repeatedly, many times in the Word of God, over and over again, we see this pattern. A blessing and a curse. A place of blessings, a, a place of curses, depending on where we place ourselves with God. And so, many times, blessings and curses don't just come just by chance. A lot of times there's a reason of why they happen, why they're happening. And it's good to pray. It's good to ask God what's going on. Hopefully all of us want to be in a place of blessings. And if that's the case, then we need to position ourselves in that place. Deuteronomy 11, 32. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. Here looking at the definition of some of these words of being in this place of blessing. You shall be careful, or you shall keep, comes from this Hebrew word shamar, which means to guard, to protect, to attend to, to take heed, to regard, to observe, to do. And this word comes from the Hebrew word asah. Asah means to do, <coughs> to accomplish, to follow, to practice, all the statutes and judgments which I am setting them for you today. So, the place of blessings, placing ourselves under God's word and will. The place of blessings, placing ourselves under God's purpose and plan. <coughs> really doing something about understanding what God wants and, and really making an effort to, to follow that plan that God has for us, whatever it may be. And, and really taking time for God to find that plan. Uh, asking people, praying, seeking, searching. Talking this morning about places. Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh be corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now this is spoken to believers. There's a place of corruption and there's a place of everlasting life depending on where we are placing ourselves. Uh, where we're sowing. If we're sowing, giving time to the flesh, yielding, doing what the flesh wants, the end result will be corruption. A place of corruption. Look well, that up. It's not a good definition. But if we want life, we have to yield to the Spirit, uh, to the Holy Spirit and to our new nature, the new spirit that God gave. We have to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and begin to practice that, practice yielding, sowing toward the kingdom of heaven. Uh, place. Look at Romans 8.13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So he's saying here, if you live, you will die. If you die, you will live. That's what the scripture is saying here. Let's look at it again in Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if you live any way you want to live, primarily after the flesh, and in Galatians he talks about that, you remember the fruit of the Spirit, and before that, he talked about the manifestations of the flesh. And he said, uh, those that do these kind 
kind of things will not see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, those that habitually, unrepentantly practice all these things, they're sowing, they're giving way to the flesh, they're living for the flesh. And I don't care if you're born again believer, I don't care if you said a prayer, I don't care what your Bible is, uh, Messianic, Baptist, whatever, if you're living a life after the flesh, you're living in great danger. And he goes on to say, now, if you die, you will live, we should be living a dying life. And again, the idea is putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, the power of the new Spirit, and also the power of the Holy Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the body. That doesn't mean you kill yourself, but that means when the body wants to do something nasty, dirty, ugly, sinful, you don't do it. You sow the Spirit. And the body, if you're human, if you're breathing, if you're alive, every person in this room, no matter what your flesh is, what nationality, your flesh is going to want to do bad. <clears throat> Those that have kids, uh, God bless you, but as you're raising them, you don't have to teach them how to be selfish. You don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to teach them how to be mean. That just comes naturally. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. So God bless those that are out there working with the children each week. And that's why we pray for them. Well, no, that's not the only reason why. But as we get older, uh, no matter how old we are, that flesh is still going to want to do things inappropriately. And we're to put to death the deeds of the body. And as Paul says, I have to buffet my body daily, lest I become a reprobate. He was a very religious, godly, spirit-filled, spirit-led man of God. And for him to say that, it makes us realize that there's a place we need to be in. Don't get lazy. Place of death, place of life, these things are important. I don't know about you, but I want to live. I want to live forever. And in order for that to happen, I've got to do certain things. Other than just accepting you, I've got to live after the Spirit. I have to need to live after the old nature. If all of a sudden I've received Yeshua, but I continue to practice and habitually live in sin, uh, it's like I'm stomping on the blood of Yeshua. It's no good. That's not good. Look at Romans 2.6. Who God will render to each one according to his deeds. Now God has a place for everyone. No matter how many people are born, no matter how many people are going to be on judgment day, God has a place for everyone. Don't worry about it. God's big. Romans 2, 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Romans 2, 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. I don't care who you are. Straight across the board. Romans 2, 9, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So, there is a place for everyone, and that place depends on our life choices. There is an eternal place for everyone, and that place depends on our place of faith. Our, our placement depends upon our placement. It's not just a random thing. God's not up there uh, playing Yahtzee, you know, with a bunch of dice. Okay, this one goes okay, here, this one goes here, this one goes here. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's a selection, and it has to do with what we select to hear. God gives us this choice. Our placement depends upon our placement. There's a place of indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish. There's a place called hell, Hades, uh, later the lake of fire. The Bible talks about it being a place of darkness, a place of great pain, agony, gnashing of teeth. Uh, a place that God really didn't design for his creation. The lake of fire being he created for the enemy. But those that don't embrace God will get put there with the enemy because there's only other two places to go. And so it's not like, well, I really, I never, do I have any other choices? No, it's either God or the devil, basically, I guess you can say. 
say it that way. So there is a literal place of judgment and eternal place that people are going to go that choose that place. And God will honor their choice. That's not what God wants, but God will honor their choice. Will it hurt God? I believe it will tear the heart of God because it's God's will that all be saved and all come to the saving knowledge of God. He didn't design us for that. There is another place of glory, honor, peace, and eternal life that he's talking about here in Romans 2. Those that choose to go the right path. Those that choose God. And it listed those things. Go back and read it later if you'd like. There's a place, whether we want to call it heaven, New Jerusalem, whatever it may be, a place that God has uh, for his people. Let's go to uh, look on here a little bit different name. Deuteronomy 12, 5. This is from our Torah portion here this weekend called Red Head. Look, behold, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes and put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and there you shall come. Here in our Torah portion, they kind of uh, talk about, quote, unquote, this place, <clears throat> this mystery place, an actual place that points to other places. Kind of unusual the way God did this, but up to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Uh, he's going to put his name there. Let's continue on to a couple of other places where he talks about the place. Deuteronomy 12, 11. Then there shall be a place <laughs> which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. And there you shall bring all that I command you. Your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offering of your hand. It's supposed to be hand right there, not hand. Oops, uh, title. Uh, your hand and all your choice vows which you bow to the Lord. So again, there's a place, a certain place where all this is to be brought. The sacrifices, the tithes, the offering. Uh, and he goes on here in our third portion later in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year, all of your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord in me. So, uh, again, talking about this place, uh, a Hebrew Hanako, this, this unique place, uh, why don't you just tell us what it is? Now, well, there's reasons I believe why God did this, because it's more than just this place, because this place is symbolic. This was a place, as we read here in Deuteronomy, a place of God's choice, a place of offering, a place of sacrifice, a place of giving, a place of worship, a place of His name. Now, just in these couple of verses that I shared with you in Deuteronomy 12 and Deuteronomy 16, I'll basically tell you, in case you don't know, that special place was Jerusalem. That's the place he was literally talking about just within context of the scripture. All the offerings, three times a year at the pilgrimage feast, they were to go to Jerusalem. That was the place that God was talking about, this special place. So, uh, Jerusalem actually has a letter sheet on it. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I've talked about that before, but it just kind of fits with what we're talking about here this morning. <laughs> this is the letter sheet. And so. The, uh, a lot of times when we're doing the erotic benediction, sometimes we'll hold up a uh, hand signal, live long and prosper, uh, Star Trek, whatever. You know, he got that. The idea is uh, the letter she. And the idea of placing God's name upon you. That's kind of the idea of why they, it's just a tradition. The Bible actually doesn't say you've got to hold your hand like this. And some people are like, oh, I can't do that. It's just tradition. But the idea is that it's symbolically kind of, kind of looks like an English W. And so uh, this letter sheen, and again, the Jerusalem, uh, geographically, it looks like it kind of has a sheen on it. That God has placed or stamped his name upon it, so to speak. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, the letter, the, the, the shin, which is made or sheen, the Hebrew letter, is the first letter in Shem. And so Shem means name, but it also means all these things also. So Shem, as in Hashem. 
Hashem, Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. Shem means name. And it also, though, means honor, authority, character, reputation, fame, memorial, monument, mark, glory, story. So the idea of Shem, the place of my name. And it could also mean the place of his glory, the place of his character, the place of his memorial. Uh, not only, if you ever see a mezuzah, we have some of them all over the place around there, just sometimes at the door. Mezuzah literally means door folks. I mean, that doesn't mean anything real spiritual. It means door, door folks, door frame. But you'll see a little uh, tubular thing, and uh, you'll see the letter Shinai. If anybody has some lack of reason, the prayer thing is a little prayer box that has the letter Shinai. There's different reasons of why it has this particular letter. <clears throat> one of the ancient names of God is Shinai. And this was one of the names that was used by God really before most of the names were used. Probably one of the more ancient names. There's different ideas about what this name means. And I'm going to kind of define it for you this morning what the name Shaddai means. And again, the name Shaddai begins with the letter She. Shaddai can mean uh, any of these things. Almighty uh, one of the mountain. Shaddai can mean almighty, sufficient, exuberant, bountiful, nourishing, sustaining. This is this word Shaddai. It is this all-inclusive word, and it means all of these things. Mighty one of the mountains. Almighty, sufficient, exuberant, bountiful, nourishing, sustaining. So the idea of machine represents Shaddai, the Almighty. So uh, I'm going to transition just for a minute and make a little side track right here. So bear with me. Galatians chapter 4, 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law or law system, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. What sounds better? Uh, but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through prophets, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, it corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So I say all of that to say this, that Jerusalem, the place, the physical place, points to and is symbolic of the new heavenly Jerusalem. That's the essence of what was saying there in Galatians 4. This physical Jerusalem isn't going to last forever. But there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem, that will be eternal. So this Jerusalem points to a new Jerusalem. Not only that, but should I? Jerusalem, the temple, the offerings, the sacrifices, the feast days, they all point to an ultimate place and person, that being the Son of the Anointed One, Yeshua, Jesus. They all point to something even more significant, a place, and we want to call it that, the place, Yeshua. Listen to what Yeshua said here. Yet I say to you that in this place, he was in the temple and he was in Jerusalem. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. One greater, because it pointed to him. Yeshua had as a sheen right in the midst of his name. God's authority, God's power. This name, Yeshua, right there in the midst is the sheen. Um, also, uh, pointing to, as I can't see that too good, but also pointing to this place of the skull. Golgotha means the place of the skull. 
saved within it. Well, what does that mean? Well, our hearts should be the place for God, Shaddai, Yeshua, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Our hearts should be that place. Our hearts is where God wants to place His Spirit. As we were reading earlier, our God here from Daniel read it, or he was just uh, commentating on it, the fact that we are the Spirit, uh, we are the temple of the Spirit of God. Our hearts, the place for God, His name, His love, His honor, His glory, His power, His authority, His character, His reputation, His memorial, His story, our hearts. I mean, it don't get any closer home than that. Uh, but yeah, but what about over here? Well, we should push it on this mountain. Remember Yeshua, the woman, the spirit, the woman, well, you know, what about this? I mean, you say over here, we say over there. Well, true worshipers should worship God in spirit and in truth. It's, it's really not about where you're at. It's about where your heart's at. It's kind of what part one of the saying here. Our hearts, our hearts are the place for giving God offerings, sacrifices, worship, thanksgiving, praise, glory, honor, reverence, adoration, homage. Our hearts. Where is our hearts at? It's not about show. It's not about necessarily about what we're all doing here in the flesh. But what's here? What's in our hearts? And that's really what counts. And only God knows that. Sometimes it's reflected out. Sometimes maybe what's going out is just a show. And maybe in here it ain't right. Hopefully they're both right. Hopefully what's out here and what's in here, they're both the same. And we're giving God glory. But most importantly, it's what's in here. I love the uh, exuberant worship. I always say this. I love like the dancing, the shouting, the jumping, and the whole nine yards. But if the heart's not in it, then it's really not, uh, really just something, it's just exciting, I guess. But uh, a person can't be standing here hardly moving at all, just like Abraham, just as good as dead almost. You may not even know if they're breathing, but in their heart, it's judging for joy, and in their heart, it's full of the line of God and offering. So it's very possible that you have a person here jumping and shouting and doing backflips, and I've seen people do backflips in church before, not here, but in another church, uh, and, and it may look like, oh my gosh, and this person looks like they're dead, but on the inside, this person could be pleasing God more than this person. And again, uh, it could be vice versa. I don't know. This person may be complaining, but hopefully their hearts are right. And so it's good to keep our hearts right with God. Our hearts in this place. Listen to what Yeshua says to us. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I don't know what kind of place you have, what kind of place you live at, but just know this is just temporary. Uh, there's a much better place coming. And, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There's this place that Yeshua is preparing for us beyond our wildest imaginations. This life is just temporary. I mean, this earth is just temporary. We're like pilgrims passing through. And so don't get too stuck on things. Don't get too caught up on the affairs of this life. Store up treasures in heaven. Look to your heart. Where is your heart in? Is it full of honoring and praise and glory of God? Because it will change your whole life. What's in here, it'll change everything. It'll change your health, it'll change your countenance. I mean, it'll change everything as long as this thing stays right. But once this thing starts getting corrupted, it, it, it affects everything. There is a place in God's grace that a believer can live that takes them to a better place today and tomorrow and forever. I hope you found that place. And I hope that you found Yeshua in your heart. If you haven't, you can. If you've never really known that you were meant and called for God's purposes, for God to live in you and breathe in you and have His being, you can. And you can just invite Him in. We don't have to have a big formal thing. Oh, okay, lift your hand. Okay, let me say a 10 minute prayer with you. Okay, hopefully that took. I just don't know. I mean, it's okay to do that. I mean, you can just whisper to him right now. I received the Yeshua. No, I, mean, I mean, it can be just simple as that. You can say it in your mind. And he hears you. 
That's one thing I love about prayer, especially when I pray and I know the Bible says, who wants this hearing? The devil can't read your mind. He can plant thoughts, but as you're whispering prayers in your heart, he can't hear that as far as I know. Uh, but God does. Many times God's answering. And, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying don't pray out loud. But I'm just saying sometimes it is great when you pray in so many different ways. And, and God's there. And again, if he wants to, I mean, it doesn't get closer than that. I mean, I don't know, sometimes when we're singing these songs, you know, Holy Spirit, come. And, and I don't know what you're thinking. If you're thinking come to the United States or come to San Antonio. Or if you're thinking come to this sanctuary. Or maybe you're thinking come right here. You know, I mean, keep bringing it in, bringing it in, bringing it in, right here. You know, don't just be vague about it. Oh, you know, just come, Holy Spirit, don't no. come, Holy Spirit, come. And sometimes when we're worshiping, I want you to bring it home, bring it on in. I mean, make it real. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, you know, and, 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 and make it real. Come along with us. That's what He wants. He wants to transform each and every one of us. Each and every one of us are a place that God wants to abide. And He wants to live and move and have this be. 